So the thyroid gland is a small butterfly-shaped gland. It lives in the neck, right around where the knot of a necktie would be. Um, it shapes sort of like a butterfly or a bow tie. And what the thyroid gland does is it controls all the metabolism and all the metabolic processes in the body. So you can think of it like the accelerator pedal in a car. And if your thyroid gland is working normally, it's producing hormone and, and the engine sort of idles at a nice normal pace. If the thyroid gland is overactive and the patient is hyperthyroid, it's like the accelerator pedal is on the floor and the engine's going really fast and all the metabolism's really speeded up. And conversely, if the patient is hypothyroid or has an underactive thyroid gland, the patient is not getting enough thyroid hormone and it's sort of like the engine is ready to stall and the patient is really tired and the metabolism is, is slowed down. What should patients expect if they do have thyroid cancer, which usually results in a total thyroidectomy? How do they survive without a thyroid gland? And what's that whole post-surgical uh, course like? The fact is for the vast majority of patients who have a total thyroidectomy, they do extremely well after the operation. The thyroid hormone that they need is given back in the form of a pill that they take daily. It's an easy pill to take in the sense that if you forget a dose or you take an extra dose by mistake, it's usually not that big a deal. And most patients get back to a normal state of metabolism, they feel completely normal, and they do extremely well on thyroid hormone replacement. Occasionally patients do complain that they don't feel right after surgery. My experience is that usually within a year after thyroid surgery, most patients feel right back to their pre-surgical baseline. But in thyroid cancer surgery, just like in any sort of medical treatment, there are always people that we find that for whatever reason struggle more after the treatment than others do. Fortunately, those are a real minority of patients, but those patients are out there. So thyroid cancer is the most common endocrine malignancy, and it affects probably 50,000 or so people per year by the most recent statistics. Um, death from thyroid cancer is, however, extremely rare. 90 to 95% of patients who get thyroid cancer will never die from it. Even patients who have relatively advanced disease have excellent survival. About 1,500 or so patients per year die from thyroid cancer. Um, and thyroid cancer typically presents as a nodule in the neck. Often it's detected incidentally, meaning that uh, the patient doesn't know it's there until they have a CAT scan because of a motor vehicle accident, a carotid Doppler study, or sometimes it can be palpable and a physician will feel it. Well, the types of treatment available for thyroid cancer usually start with surgery and surgical removal of the thyroid cancer and all affected thyroid uh, lymph nodes, perithyroidal lymph nodes. Um, and then based on the extent of cancer, radioactive iodine may be considered. Radioactive iodine is concentrated in thyroid cancer and thyroid tissue and destroys that tissue. And if there's any residual cancer left behind, the hope is that radioactive iodine will destroy the residual cancer. Well, thyroid cancer is certainly on the rise nationally. It's the fastest growing cancer in uh, women and a rapidly growing cancer in men. And in fact, it's one of the few cancers that still continues to tick upward, a trend upward in terms of its frequency. Many people do say that it is on the rise in Western Pennsylvania, but as far as I know, that's never been actually proven. I think from my perspective, I'm a little jaded because I have a thyroid cancer practice. So I see thyroid cancer constantly. So from my point of view, it looks like everybody has thyroid cancer. I don't think that's the case. It does seem from some of the epidemiologic literature that thyroid cancer is more common in younger patients. So it may very well be that the rise in thyroid cancer that we're seeing nationally is being driven by an increase that's specific to younger and increasingly younger patients. Why that is, I think no one really knows for sure. There's theories that endocrine disruptors or other uh, toxins in the environment affect younger people more so than older people since the industrialization of the United States and um, the advances in, in chemistries, plastics, and the way that toxins have increasingly worked their way into our environment, that seems like a very plausible explanation. But at this point, it's still really just a hypothesis and nobody's proven that. So that may explain why thyroid cancer is increasing. So I would say the main um, thrust of research in thyroid cancer is in diagnostic and therapeutic molecular testing, molecular genetics. The idea being that we can learn a lot about a thyroid cancer based on understanding the genes that are present in a tumor. 
Um, that's extremely helpful and in fact something that we use routinely in our clinical practice for making the diagnosis of thyroid cancer in the approximately 30% of fine needle aspiration biopsies that are indeterminate, meaning that when the cytopathologist looks at the cells that come out of the tumor, the cytopathologist is unable to tell us whether that tumor is benign or malignant. They call that kind of a specimen indeterminate. They don't know what it is. If the molecular genetic testing that we've developed at the University of Pittsburgh Medical Center is done on that specimen and is positive, we know with very good certainty that cancer is present 85 to 100 percent of the time in some cases, and we can act accordingly. Um, there's also a very rapidly growing field of therapeutic molecular diagnostics and molecular uh, genotyping, and the idea there is that we can better match specific treatments for specific kinds of cancer, again based on the identifiable molecular targets in a tumor. So this has the greatest relevance at this point for advanced cancers that usually require systemic chemotherapy and what are sometimes called small molecule or directed therapies that really try to target that specific cancer. On an increasing basis, the identified genes in those cancers provide the target for those molecules or their systemic chemotherapies so we can better and more exactly match the kind of therapy that we're giving to the specific genetic type of cancer that a patient may have. Sure, I mean, molecular genetics and molecular testing, tumor genotyping, and this sort of genetically directed therapy is a big issue in every kind of cancer. Just as a, a background on thyroid cancer, thyroid cancer is, relatively speaking, an uncommon cancer. More people die of breast cancer. More people die of lung cancer. More people die of colon cancer every year than even get thyroid cancer. And remember, most people who get thyroid cancer will never die from their disease. So this isn't, thyroid cancer isn't a high priority for funders. So thyroid cancer has always, unfortunately, taken a back seat to many of these other bigger and I think it's fair to argue potentially more severe cancers. Now, thyroid cancer can also be as bad as any colon, breast, or lung cancer. And in fact, the most aggressive solid tumor that's known is in fact a thyroid cancer. But those cancers are very rare. So we're left with a cancer that isn't often fatal for most people, but occasionally can be. And in patients who have advanced disease, they can have a serious cancer, yet it's a, it's a really underfunded and very understudied cancer. So we are trying to generate more interest in this so we can better take care of our patients. Historically, we've had to piggyback thyroid cancer research on the back of research done for other cancers. And we've made some um, quite impressive and important gains with that kind of a model. Um, we're all very excited that this age of molecular genetic testing is growing because it's giving us increasing information about the thyroid cancers that we're treating in our patients and more options for better treatment for, for those patients. So that is big at UPMC as it is nationally. I would say though it's fair to represent that UPMC is one of the leading centers nationally and probably internationally for molecular genetic research that is specifically geared toward thyroid cancer. The simple answer is money. <laughs> we need money. And we're not going to get it from the federal government. We're certainly not going to get it during the sequester. And even when the government was flush, we weren't getting money from them either. Thyroid cancer funding is not a top national priority. It affects a small um, but very well identified group of patients. And I think the fact is, unless we can get those patients and their families, their corporations, their businesses to underwrite further research, research will continue to take a back seat to the other genetic research that's going on for other cancers. And we'll continue to be sort of, you know, behind the eight ball when it comes to offering new and cutting edge therapies for, for thyroid cancer. This research is ongoing. We do have grateful patients that help us and their help has helped us achieve measurable and demonstrative accomplishments. But the only way to keep it going is to get more money and more support from patients because I just don't think it's likely to come from anywhere else. So the interesting thing about thyroid cancer is that it typically is absolutely painless and there aren't a lot of associated signs or symptoms other than the fact that many patients with thyroid cancer will present with a nodule in their neck. Oftentimes those nodules are not easily felt so they're picked up on um, imaging that's done for other reasons. But 
everyone agrees that the most important way to find thyroid cancer is to first find thyroid nodules, which means you need to get an annual neck exam. And whether it's from your gynecologist, whether it's from your primary care doctor, whether it's from another doctor that you may see for another reason, if you get your neck checked, that's the best way to find thyroid cancer. Once a thyroid nodule is found, if it's a nodule that's of a reasonably decent size or if it has suspicious features on a neck ultrasound, it usually then requires fine needle aspiration biopsy and through a combination of looking at the cells that come out of the nodule as well as associated genetic testing that we do here, we're able to determine is it a high risk of cancer, is it a low risk of cancer, is it an obvious cancer, or is it, in, which is the case in most cases, is it an obviously benign thyroid nodule that just needs some increased surveillance but no further intervention.